coming today. Um, this is our um, spring mock seminar, and mock is the Maternal Adolescent Child Health Working Group at Duke Global Health Institute. Um, there are a number of us we meet regularly, and there's a lot going on in maternal adolescent child health at Duke. And this uh, forum, this speaker series, helps us highlight some of that. Um, in particular, today's focus is on Global Reproductive Health Speaker Series. Um, Megan Hushko, um, uh, uh, Women's Health Group and Initiative, has helped uh, formulate that. The mock group is led by um, Dr. Kate Wetton. And um, as I mentioned, it's a, a, a way to coalesce all of the different expertise and faculty and staff with interest in this um, population group and research in that area. So I'm going to highlight, so for today's panel speaker, I'm going to um, give some brief bio backgrounds on our four panelists. Um, and then I'm going to let them give their presentations one after each other. If you have clarifying questions, we can ask those briefly after each presentation, but otherwise hold your questions till the end. Um, so that folks have a chance to sort of, some of the questions will be applicable to more than one panelist and we'd like a chance for a more facilitated discussion. Uh, but thank you for coming today. We're really excited to have everybody here. Um, so first I'd like to introduce Megan Hutchko. Uh, she is a medical doctor with a master's degree in public health and she's associate professor of obstetrics and gynecology and global health. It's a dual appointment. She'll be talking today about improving access to cervical cancer prevention for rural women in Kenya. Um, she earned, earned her bachelor's degree right here at Duke um, and completed medical school at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine and residency training at Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center. Prior to coming to Duke, she was an associate professor of medicine at um, UC San Francisco, where she completed her fellowship in reproductive infectious disease. Uh, she's a practicing OBGYN um, generalist and specializes in cervical cancer prevention through her clinical work and global women's health research. Uh, her research focuses on optimizing the diagnosis and treatment of cervical cancer amongst vulnerable women in settings where health disparities occur. And she's been working in Western Kenya since 2006. And she's been with Duke for not quite a year yet. She started this fall. So we're very excited to present uh, some of her work and um, her contributions to maternal and adolescent child health. I'd also like to introduce Dr. Melissa Watt. Her doctorate is in um, health education and health behavior from UNC Chapel Hill. She's an assistant research professor in global health, and she's also the director of the Master of Science in Global Health program uh, at DGHI. She'll be talking today about fetal alcohol syndrome in South Africa. Her research um, has broadly focused on understanding and addressing gender-specific health issues in sub-Saharan Africa with specific attention to HIV, substance abuse, and mental health. In Tanzania, she's leading two studies one on developing and evaluating mental health treatment for women with obstetric fistula, and another aimed at improving access to long-term ARVs for pregnant women with HIV. In South Africa, she's engaged in studies on the prevention, prevention of fetal alcohol syndrome disorder and HIV care engagement in the context of sexual trauma. As I mentioned, her PhD is from down the road at UNC. She also has a master's degree in gender and development from the University of Sussex, Sussex in the UK. Um, so, uh, due to a family emergency, um, Kathy Sikama wasn't able to join us today, but we're very lucky to have um, Marta Malawa um, here with us. She is a DGHI postdoctoral scholar um, and is part of Duke's Interdisciplinary Research Training Program and AIDS, T32 program. She works with um, Dr. Sikama and Watt on an NIMH-funded study to improve HIV care engagement among women who have experienced sexual trauma in Cape Town, South Africa. Um, her other research interests include improving our understanding of how social networks influence HIV-related behaviors. And she's pursuing some of these interests through, um, uh, as a fellow through the Social Networks and Health Scholars Training Program here at Duke. Okay. She received her PhD in Health Behavior also at UNC Chapel Hill. And she has a master's degree in International Health from Johns Hopkins um, Bloomberg School of Public Health. Her doctoral dissertation work focused on examining how peer network norms influence men's perpetration um, of intimate partner violence in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. And finally, we have another relatively new faculty member that we're excited to present today. This is uh, Dr. Gita. Sunasia. I, was, I just need one second. Sunasia. Um, she's an associate professor in radiation oncology and global health, a dual appointment. 
And she'll be talking today about cancer capacity building uh, in Botswana and managing cervical cancer in resource limited settings. Um, her clinical specialties include the treatment of breast and gynecological uh, malignancies. Her research program is focused on health services research and access to cancer care and patient outcomes. She has a particular interest in disparities in cancer treatments and outcomes of HIV-infected cancer patients, both in the United States and in Botswana. Um, she graduated from the Warren Albert Medical School of Brown University and completed her residency training in radiation oncology at the University of Pennsylvania where she served as chief resident. She then pursued a master's degree in health policy research from the University of Pennsylvania. She's been working with investigators from the National Cancer Institute and the American Cancer Society. And here at Duke, she's working to address disparities in cancer treatment for HIV-infected people and developing programs to grow cancer capacity in low- and middle-income countries. A pretty amazing group. Very excited to have all four of them together. Um, and I'm going to let Megan start off with her presentation. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I just want to check. Um, how do I <laughs> So, Spoiler alert. Um, okay, so today I'm going to talk about improving access to cervical cancer prevention for women in rural Kenya. Um, and this reflects some of the work that I've been doing there for about the past 11 or 12 years. Um, and just to orient us, I'm going to introduce a little bit of the health disparities in, um, in cancer. Cancer is a disease where there is a disparity um, across the globe um, between both uh, high income and low income countries and in particular cancers. Um, specifically among women. So cervical cancer is the fourth, fourth most common cancer in women. There are over uh, 250,000 uh, 250, new cases a year. Uh, I'm sorry, there are over 500,000 new cases a year and 250,000 deaths. Um, in an era where we have an effective vaccine against cervical cancer and effective screening programs and where rates in developed countries are going down, the WHO still predicts an increase um, to over 300,000 deaths a year by 2030. Um, and 88% of the new cases and deaths occur in resource limited settings, um, and those are settings where less than 5% of global health spending occurs. So uh, the prior UN Secretary General has called the increase in the burden of cancer overall in low and income countries a um, public health emergency that we're watching unfold in front of us in slow motion. Um, so this is just a map that uh, expresses the disparities in incidence. It's a little pale, but you can see that the dark countries with darker blue have higher incidence of um, cancer. I work in East Africa where there are, are some of the highest incidences of cervical cancer, and that, again, um, is um, that trend is followed through with global, incident, global rates of mortality around the world. So the reason, one of the main reasons for that disparity is because there is not access to the screening um, programs that work so effectively to prevent cervical cancer in developed countries. And there are specific challenges to screening in low and middle income countries. Um, these are places where there's often poor transportation, both a lack of vehicle and a lack of uh, navigable roads. Um, the clinics in general are poorly supplied. There tend to be lower numbers of trained staff. They're often um, working on multiple um, disease types. There's a lack of laboratory infrastructure. So if you think here that women um, get screened with a pap smear that then goes to a lab um, uh, techno uh, technologist who processes that, it's then interpreted by a cytopathologist and then approved by a pathologist. Um, so there's multiple levels of equipment and expertise um, that are required just to reach one person's pap smear. And much of that is lacking um, throughout uh, the areas in Sub-Saharan and East Africa where I work. There's a lack of computerized tracking systems. So for each step of a pap smear based process, you need to record um, that the specimen was taken, where it's going, who reads it, get it back to the clinic or provider, and then get it back to the woman. So in some areas, it's um, in many areas of the world, that, that's not even imaginable that that kind of, kind of um, tracking would happen. And then there are just limitations in space, water, and electricity. I'd say that about two-thirds to three-quarters of the, the clinics that I work in don't have running water and don't have regular 
electricity. So we really have to work on that. So the flip side of that is with those challenges, um, there are some ideas for optical screen characteristics um, for cervical cancer in these settings. Um, ideally, in contrast to uh, pap smear, uh, a screening test that would allow same day results would be optimal, something that's low cost um, to fit into national um, or regional budgets. It needs minimal infrastructure requirements, so not something that needs to set up transportation lab and computer systems. And it needs to be easy to learn and administer with very simple um, results to ensure it. Again, as a gynecologist, I deal with abnormal pap smear results all the time, and there are about seven different types of pap abnormalities that I have to figure out what they mean and what's the next step for the patient. So the easiest thing would be, this is positive, what's the next step? Or this is negative, what's the next step? And then there needs to be, ideally, an adequate sensitivity or specificity so that they could possibly be coupled directly with treatment. Contrast in the United States, everyone who has an abnormal pap smear goes to a next step where they get a second exam that confirms disease. That requires a second expert, a second visit, another lab um, specimen. So we are ideally hoping to find a test that, if that test is positive, the woman can go directly to the next step of treatment or closer follow-up. So in 2013, the WHO, recognizing these challenges and some of the ideal um, conditions, developed some guidelines for screening and treatment um, of precancerous lesions to prevent cervical cancer. Um, they replaced earlier guidelines, which just sort of gave a blueprint of different ideas that you could do with concrete recommendations that took into account these limitations. Um, so they recommended using HPV testing. I think most of us know that HPV testing is, uh, HPV is the virus that causes most abnormal pap smears and cervical cancers. Um, and the WHO specifically preferred HPV testing over visual inspection methods or pap smears. Um, and then they also recommended that treatment be based on screening alone without a secondary confirmation test. And then they said that treatment should be cryotherapy, which is freezing abnormal cells. Um, it's very easy to learn and can be done by non-physicians, um, but uh, programs needed to provide a backup overall. So I'm presenting that as a little bit of a background to a setting where I started working in 2006. Um, the the take-home of that is that their cervical cancer is a big issue. There is a disparity. It requires a modified screening or prevention program. And there are guidelines that have taken in evidence and the situation on the ground and provided recommendations for what should be done. So over the probably seven years I was working in Kenya before those guidelines came out, I was working with different types of screening programs, doing some diagnostic validation, but my real goal was to get cervical cancer screening to women in the community who needed it. Um, and so as, in a short time here, I don't have time to go the whole trajectory of my career, but as I was looking for the next steps, I wanted to ask the question of how you could get these guidelines, uh, get these cervical cancer prevention strategies to the women who needed them. So I began working there in 2007 with an HIV program called the Family AIDS Care and Education Program. I designed their cervical cancer screening program. We did sort of a high intensity program in a fairly high resource clinic. And um, we screened all the women. We confirmed their diagnosis with colposcopy, um, which is that second step, because I was living there and we did a lot of training. And within these clinic settings, we got 90% of eligible women screened. So with that um, in mind, over, uh, about five years after we started the program, we decided to scale up to smaller clinics throughout Western Kenya. We took the Kenyan guidelines for screening, which at that time recommended a visual inspection. We worked in partnership with the Ministry of Health. We carefully selected sites that were um, <coughs> smaller facilities, but pretty well resourced facilities. They had water, they had access to some sort of electricity. Um, they were well supported by this HIV care program, and we put our trainers out in all those sites. Um, so like I said, at the main site, we screened 90% of women. In these sites, um, we screened about 20% of eligible women. And there were some serious concerns about the quality of care. So that was a huge eye-opening experience for me um, in terms of um, implementing 
these recommendations that were based on the needs of low income settings. How do we personalize them? How do we get them to where they need to be? And how do we provide them in a setting where we can maintain the quality and yet reach all the women we need to reach? So um, I wrote an R01 asking the question, how do we do that? Um, and so one of the strategies that I proposed to the implementation and dissemination science section that I wrote it to was, let's do implementation and dissemination science. And it seemed to exactly fit the problem that I was facing, is that we had a problem, we have evidence-based solutions, but there was a big mismatch with how they were getting to the population that they needed them. So the basic design of um, implementation and dissemination science, as many of you know, is to identify the problem. So do that through your own experience, through literature and policy reviews, through formative research with community partners, identify, find the evidence um, for potential interventions and solutions, review that, develop your strategy, and then work with key stakeholders in your target community to implement, to adapt and implement that strategy. And then the study itself is used, is measuring that implementation and then measuring how you're able to refine it um, as the study goes along. So we proposed a three-part um, study in which we used our formative work to identify the gaps, develop our implementation strategy. We defined cervical cancer prevention as, as being composed of these four parts, raising awareness among women that screening is important and that's available, providing effective screening that works so it's easy to interpret as ha has a consistent quality. Um, and the protocol is really simple for the, the providers to interpret. Um, we need to get the results to the women, um, either with a same-day screening or if we were using HPV testing, we need to figure out a way that women actually were able to access their results in a timely manner. And then we wanted to make sure they linked to safe and effective treatment because prevention of cervical cancer is not just screening, you have to treat women who are at high risk for cervical cancer. So, we use our, our form, we did some formative work as we were writing the grant to specifically identify the barriers to screening. We did focus group discussions, in-depth interviews, site assessments, um, and we found not surprising to people that worked there, surprising to me as a gynecologist, but people did not like pelvic exams. Providers and patients didn't like them at all. There were a lot of reasons for stigma. These are small communities. Women did not want to go to a small community and have a man do their pelvic exam that they were going to see in the market a few months later. Um, they'd never seen a speculum before. They were scared. They were nervous. People would come out after having <coughs> had a pelvic exam and scare the rest of the women waiting into not having them. There were um, then women perceived a lack of willingness or knowledge among the providers who were counseling them. Um, there was surprisingly a lack of sensitivity. People felt that that providers were anxious to talk about such a sensitive subject as uh, cervical cancer. And then a pelvic exam requires the time and the skills of the provider. Um, in the Ministry of Health Clinics, providers could get transferred from site to site, um, and so we would train someone and then they would go to another site, and then someone would be transferred in who had never done screening or pelvic exams. The quality of doing a visual inspection, a pelvic exam which requires looking at the cervix was difficult to maintain with low numbers or without constant supervision, and the interpretation can be variable. Um, the protocols that the Ministry of Health has set out were quite confusing, um, and then the space equipment and supplies would be difficult to maintain. If we were buying gloves and cotton swabs for our exams, and then there were no gloves to do blood tests, or um, you know, exams on HIV exposed infants, obviously the gloves were going to that. So there was no way in a resource constrained setting to say, we're gonna save one piece of these supplies just for cervical cancer treatment. And then treatment. Um, uh, the ideal treatment is something that can be offered the same day or um, quite quickly after the screening takes place and it's being done with cryotherapy. Many, um, Programs advocate for screen and treat, so putting a cryotherapy in the same place where the screening is done, and that's just not feasible in these small clinics. Um, cryotherapy machines do have a cost, they take up space, they require security, and then if we weren't having people who were trained and comfortable with exams, we certainly were not able to maintain enough people comfortable with doing cryotherapy. Referring women to um, a secondary site led to a lot of attrition, um, and because of the cost,
across the distance and understanding the need for a second visit. Um, and then women would get a repeat visual exam at the next clinic and the results were different. So it was positive and she got referred and the provider who was going to perform her treatment saw it and it was negative, they didn't provide that treatment. So we took that formative work and we, we decided we wanted to choose a screening technique that did not require a pelvic exam. We happened to start this um, process at a time when care HPV, a low-cost HPV test, was becoming available in Kenya. Um, so we decided to go with HPV screening. And furthermore, we took the screening out of the, the clinician, out of the pelvic exam room, and offered it to women in a self-collected method. So it wouldn't require a pelvic exam. It wouldn't require the time of a trained provider. And the results would be simple to interpret. So we were left in the study to address um, educating the providers on patients on the meeting results and developing a pretty straightforward lab infrastructure. More importantly, we wanted to develop the implementation strategy. So we couldn't just, we didn't want to just put HPV tests into clinics. We wanted to develop a whole strategy that would get as many women in the community screen as possible. So we decided that we would use a community health campaign-based model. Um, a group that I had worked with in Kenya had done community health campaigns for HIV testing, hypertension testing, diabetes testing, and malaria screening. Um, they had been highly effective, got huge numbers of people in the community, um, and we had done some cervical cancer screening in part of them, in, in pieces of them that were highly attended. So the, the benefit of the community health campaign is that it allows for intensified leakage to treatment only for screen positive women because you're getting the rest of the community that's just getting screened out of the clinic. Um, and then there's some efficiencies with the group messaging, the transport, and the high volume. So our implementation model simply was the um, use standardized and validated outreach and education, provide screening with low cost HPV, we compared community health campaigns to health facilities. We notified women using text messaging, and then we referred them for cryotherapy if they had a positive test. So we did this, um, we are doing this in a two-phase randomized trial. Phase one is done, and I'm just going to present the results on the next slide, where we looked at that community health campaigns versus health facilities. Um, and then in phase two, we're going to look at treatment. We're now working with the communities to develop ways to improve linkage to treatment. So what do we hope to learn? I should change what did we learn. We're hoping to determine whether a community-based cervical cancer screening is effective, acceptable, and cost-effective. We want to work with the community to develop a context-specific um, treatment uh, linkage to treatment strategy. We want to develop a toolkit for working with the community in the future to contextualize these interventions. And then we want to fought, use our findings to push the widespread adoption of strategies. This might be second to last. Okay, so we do have some outcomes. We finished screening at the end of September. Um, we screened, uh, I mean, we finished our last campaign at the end of September. They last a little bit longer than um, screening. 6,500 women attended either the CHCs or the health facilities. These are women within the age group that we're looking at. And we saw a greater screening uptake, a greater percentage of people who got treatment, and a lower cost and a lower time per visit in the community health campaigns. So overall, we found community health campaigns to be a more effective place to reach greater numbers of women in the community. What we also found surprising um, was that there was a higher HPV positivity rate in the health facilities. Um, what we found not surprising is that the overall proportion of women or percentage of women who came for treatment was low. So with that, our next steps, we have this ongoing um, process that we're working with the communities to develop a strategy for enhanced linkage to, to treatment using mix, a mix of qualitative data and feedback from, these, uh, from base one. And then we want to identify ways to increase population coverage at the community health campaigns. So we're getting the high-risk women that are going to the clinics as reflected in that higher HPV positivity rate. We want to reach all, we want to reach a broader population in the health campaigns. And then we want to work to develop a more robust and health strategy to help with our linkage um, between um, screening and results and then results in treatment. So I'm out of time, so I won't go over the conclusions, um, but I did want to make an acknowledgement. Um, this is an R01 funded by the NCI, and I just got back from a trip to Kenya on Saturday, 
and I'm so impressed. This is my study team, the team leadership, and the 13 um, members of the team that are on the ground doing this work in Kenya. They're amazing dedication in a place that really has very little internet, very little electricity, and very poor transportation. Um, and I look forward to taking one or two questions now and then the rest later. One or two clarifying questions, otherwise we'll wait till the end. Sorry, 12 minutes was hard. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hi, everyone. And thanks for the invitation to be part of this panel. So I'm going to speak about the research I've been doing um, on fetal alcohol spectrum disorder prevention in South Africa. Um, so I've been working in bars in South Africa since um, about 2008. And so whenever I do a, a field trip to Cape Town to, to go work in bars, I always get a Get some smiles. Um, but these are these are some of the settings where we've been working. And as you can see, there's so these are these are bars, venue, we call them venues, alcohol serving <coughs> venues, because they don't always meet this classification of, of bars or taverns. Um, but these are the types of settings. Um, it's in we've been working now in two different township, urban township communities in Cape Town. Um, but they really range from kind of more established environments where you have nice um, tables and chairs and even food available along with alcohol to this picture up here where our research study coordinator is holding up a jug of um, this thing called alcohol that um, was being served um, under a tin roof, basically. And this was sort of the dredges from uh, vineyards in the area. Because um, in the Western Cape, of course, we all know that nice wine comes from the Western Cape of South Africa. So really a range of sites, but, but it's kind of, these are places that are really kind of the heart and soul of much of the township community. So alcohol in South Africa is actually very, um, very interesting and I think unique. So if you look, the proportion of individuals, this is from the Demographic Health Survey, who actually drink any alcohol is pretty low. I mean, only 16% of women report that they drink any alcohol. But among those drinkers, there are these patterns of alcohol consumption that are incredibly harmful. So among drinkers, drinking is heavy and it's episodic. So of these women who do report alcohol use, 25% had harmful um, alcohol uh, use in the past weekend. Um, and, and, and characterized typically by binge drinking. I'll speak a little bit more about that. But in the Western Cape, heavy alcohol use has deep cultural and economic roots. So given this, given this um, economy of, of vineyards and um, what they call wine farms um, in South Africa, there's been just a lot of exposure to alcohol and intergenerational exposure to alcohol, including several generations ago being um, paid uh, for labor in the form of alcohol. So we um, started in 2008, this was a study led by um, Kathy Sikema here in the Department of Psychology and Seth Kalichman at the University of Connecticut and um, a colleague at the University of Stellenbosch in South Africa doing a study working in bars looking at HIV risk and in particular considering how trauma, gender-based violence, and mental health contributed to HIV um, risk in the setting. We were working with women, and so it obviously raised a question um, of what does pregnancy look like in this setting, and what is the role of pregnancy in this setting. So we know that the risks of drinking during pregnancy are very high, um, that alcohol exposure in utero is the most preventable um, cause of poor birth outcomes. Um, exposure to alcohol puts a child at risk of FASD, which includes premature delivery, neonatal death, low birth weight, and a whole range of neurodevelopmental disorders that are then manifest in childhood and far beyond, um, with lifelong effects of cognitive and behavioral functioning, educational achievement, long-term <coughs> social outcomes. So an incredible um, burden then to, to, the, to the child, to the family, and to society as a whole. Um, Community-based studies in the Western Cape have documented the highest rates of FASD that have been documented anywhere in the world. So there is a, a colleague actually um, who spoke at DJHI a few weeks ago, uh, Philip May, who has an appointment at UNC um, 
at the School of Public Health, and he's been doing epidemiological surveys in the Western Cape for decades at this point. And they found FASD prevalence as high as 18 to 28 percent in many communities, in sort of rural agricultural um, communities. These mothers of children of FASD reported uh, drinking patterns mostly on weekends, about six drinks per day, and I'll speak about some of our findings. Uh, drinks of choice being beer followed by wine, and many came from alcohol abusing families, so it's sort of this intergenerational um, issue. So in this study that we were doing looking at HIV risk among women in these venues, we were doing a five-year study that was multi-methods and longitudinal. So we did cross-sectional surveys in the bars. We, recorded a co we recruited a cohort of 560 women across 12 different venues and followed them every four months over the course of a year. We did a lot of qualitative work. We actually did 159 in-depth interviews, which was a lot, of, a lot of data and a lot of papers, I can tell you, um, uh, and, and observations in the bars. So we had a lot of opportunities then, given these different, um, different pieces of data, to integrate questions about pregnancy and to understand um, what pregnancy looked like in alcohol um, exposure during pregnancy. So in the in-depth interviews, for example, as we kind of became more and more interested in this topic, we then did 24 um, in-depth interviews with women who were selected specifically for either being pregnant and recruited from the bars or um, reporting that they had, had consumed alcohol during pregnancy. So we were able through this data to answer three questions. We wanted to be able to answer how common is pregnancy among venue attenders. Um, so these women who we know are in venues drinking. What does alcohol look like during the pregnancy period? And why do women drink during pregnancy? So in terms of how common it is, um, in these cross-sectional surveys, we were able to um, get over 2,000 unique surveys. So we did these surveys in the bars with women who were um, there. And 11% reported at the time of the survey that they were pregnant. We also, um, in the cohort that we followed, these 560 women that we followed over time, there were some who were <coughs> pregnant at the time um, that they were enrolled. And then over the course of a year, um, 99 women, so 18%, reported being pregnant at some point. So most of those were new incident pregnancy. So sometime they reported that they were not pregnant, and then they reported at a subsequent <coughs> interview um, that they were pregnant. So 18% became pregnant over the course of the year. So what does alcohol look like, alcohol use look like during pregnancy? So because we were following women um, in a cohort and we were assessing pregnancy at each time point, this allowed us to look at incident pregnancy, so new pregnancy. So we had a data point um, among women when they were not pregnant and then we had a subsequent data point when they were pregnant. So as you can see, the alcohol, um, so audit was the measure that we used to measure alcohol consumption. It's kind of one of the most common measures in the field of, um, of alcohol. Um, and, oops, sorry, I meant to be pointing. Um, so in the pre-recognition, in, in, the, in the most recent survey where they said they were not pregnant, their, alcohol, their audit score was a 14.8. So this ranges from 0 to 48. Um, but it was far above the cutoff of hazardous drinking of eight. And then in the post-recognition, it reduced um, significantly, but still remained far above the hazardous cutoff. And then if you look just at the proportion that are above the hazardous drinking cutoff, at pre-recognition, before they said they were pregnant, now they may have been pregnant, but not known and reported that they were pregnant, 79% and that dropped to 73%. So in other words, drinking was really continuing during this pregnancy period. So then we were able to use the qualitative data to assess um, and understand why do women drink during pregnancy. We found five primary themes. One is to cope with negative stressors and emotions. Um, many of those stressors are related to the pregnancy itself. Um, many are related to the relationship issues that um, may or may not have to do directly with the pregnancy. Um, and certainly a lot of um, trauma emerged from that. 
The second was drinking as rec re uh, recreation and social connection. So this was the place where women went to kind of get social support, to be with their friends. And this was a setting where very few women had employment. So it was, um, it was really kind of this place they came for connection. The third is social norms around drinking. Everyone says this is just what you do. I know a lot of women who drank during pregnancy. Um, and that people, women, had encouraged other women or been encouraged by their friends to continue to drink during pregnancy. So there was no sort of shaming of drinking alcohol during pregnancy. Um, fourth was lack of attachment to the fetus and baby. So most of these pregnancies, um, I, think in the, I think in our 24 in-depth interviews, all but one were unplanned pregnancies. So there wasn't sort of an intentionality of getting pregnant. Um, and, and there was not a lot of future thinking of sort of what life is going to look like after the baby is born. So there was this real sort of sense of living in the moment um, and looking out for kind of the day-to-day -day interest, but not necessarily thinking ahead to the implications and thinking about sort of the, the pregnancy as also um, as your future child. And the fifth, of course, not surprisingly, was addiction. So how can we intervene for early prevention of FASD is what sort of the question we were left with at the end of this data collection. So I was fortunate to get a small grant from the Maternal, Adolescent, and Child Health Working Group. And the aim of this was to build upon the, um, the study that we had done to understand um, more fully the risk of alcohol-exposed pregnancy among women who drink in venues. So not just who is pregnant, but sort of what, what is the risk of women getting pregnant and having an alcohol-exposed pregnancy. So in the literature, this sort of risk of alcohol-exposed pregnancy is someone who is sexually active, either not using contraceptives or using them inconsistently or incorrectly, and drinking at hazardous levels. So if you are at risk of pregnancy and drinking at hazardous levels, then you are at risk of an alcohol-exposed pregnancy. So um, the methods that we took were 200 um, brief venue-based surveys with women and 24 in-depth interviews um, with selected women that we recruited from the venues. And then the, the main data that we were able to get out of the small grant that we hadn't measured before was this issue of contraceptive use. So when we started thinking about sort of, when we, when we added this pregnancy question um, to, our, to our HIV study, um, contraceptive use kind of wasn't really what we were thinking about at that point. And, and in retrospect, was a missed opportunity, but um, we were able to, to look at it here. So one of the things that we asked in that survey is, um, we asked if they had ever been pregnant, and the large majority, um, I think about 80%, um, 176 out of 200, had, had a previous pregnancy. And we asked them to think about the pregnancy, um, to think about their pregnancy and report their drinking patterns during the pregnancy. So this is the Audit C. It's a distilled version of the audit that asks about, um, about uh, <coughs> frequency, quantity of drinking, as well as frequency of binge drinking. And I think this is, to me, what really stands out. So asked on a typical day when drinking, how many drinks do you have? So about 40% said that they, during their pregnancy, typically drank five or more drinks per occasion. And then when we asked how often during your pregnancy did you have six or more drinks on one occasion, about a third said on a weekly basis that they were sort of participating in this binge drinking. And all of the data shows that it's the binge drinking that really contributes to, to the impact of alcohol in utero. So then this other question that we have is what is the risk of pregnancy? So of the 200 women, all were drinking alcohol. Um, the majority were sexually active. And then of those 152 sexually active women, um, 31 were not using any contraceptives, and most of those still met the criteria for hazardous drinking. Um, two were pregnant and also drinking at hazardous levels. And then we had 121 women who were using contraceptives, but most commonly using short-acting contraceptives. And the most common form of contraception was, um, was injectable, something like Depo-Provera. So we had 20% not using any contraceptives and 53% using short acting. So in conclusion, um, looking at these two sets of data together, pregnancy was common. There are patterns of episodic heavy drinking, binge drinking during pregnancy, 
There were these sort of attitudes at a community level that continued um, to, to fuel drinking during pregnancy. And the risk of alcohol exposed pregnancy was high, both because of no contraceptive use or short acting contraceptive use that we know is challenging um, and, can, and creates a, an opportunity for an unintended, um, unplanned pregnancy. So the implications for practice are that, um, that these venues are really important spaces that need to be given attention for work for prevention of FASD. Um, there are sites where it's very easy to identify women who are heavy drinkers and at risk of pregnancy, um, and also to, address, to identify women who are pregnant. And, and in addressing that, we really need to think about these um, social and economic drivers. So um, based on this data, I've submitted an R21 application um, to NIAAA, the, the National Institute of Alcohol Abuse. Um, and what we are proposing is to use a group model to work in venues um, uh, using an empowerment approach and a motivational interviewing approach to really build agency and self-efficacy around pregnancy prevention in particular and alcohol, um, alcohol reduction. But our focus is really much more on how do we prevent pregnancy and give women the tools to plan for pregnancy and to think, think in a future direction in order to prevent um, FASD. So I just want to acknowledge um, team at DGHI and, um, and also in South Africa as well as um, the MAC working group for the funding. Thank you. Um, it's my pleasure to be here to um, fill in for Kathy Sykema, who was not able to be here today, um, and to represent our study team, including um, Melissa Watt and others in the audience in on this panel presentation titled Coping with Trauma, Implications of Improving HIV Care Engagement Among Women in South Africa. We know that the most effective way to prevent AIDS-related morbidity and mortality is to achieve and maintain viral suppression. Um, and that comes from getting people onto antiretroviral treatment and retaining in care and keeping engaged. Now, as this UNAIDS visual kind of shows the drop of participants over the HIV care continuum, it depicts some of the challenges that we face in the field. There's challenges from identifying people who are HIV positive and getting them tested so they know their status. Once they know their status, there's challenges and a drop that we see in getting people initiated onto ARTs and linked to care. And then there's further drops when we look at how many of the people who are living with HIV are actually virally suppressed. So in this visual of adults in Sub-Saharan Africa, we see that of all people living with HIV, about 29% of them are virally suppressed. So given the importance of reaching viral suppression and getting people on meds, adherent to their meds, and retained in care, our team has been working to develop and evaluate strategies to improve HIV care and engagement. The work that we do is really at the intersection of mental health and HIV. Um, in 2010, Dr. Sikama, Dr. Watt, and others proposed, you know, really put forward out there that mental health treatment for individuals who are living with HIV can lead to a reduction in HIV transmission. And the hypothesized pathway here is that mental health treatment, which includes behavioral mental health interventions as well as pharmacological interventions, reduce, you know, mental health symptoms. They can also reduce substance use, they can reduce stress, and they can improve adaptive coping skills or reduce maladaptive and avoided <coughs> coping. And by changing those mediators, then we can see a reduction in sexual risk behavior or improvements in adherence to antiretroviral treatment, subsequently reducing viral load and really reducing forward HIV transmission. And this model serves as the framework for some of the work that we're doing right now in South Africa. In this setting, women in South Africa experience multiple epidemics that are co-occurring, interacting with each other, and really exacerbating their burden of disease. And these, this, this HIV syndemic, the, the volume of sexual trauma, the volume of HIV 
is really has important implications for HIV risk and treatment. And it's important that any HIV prevention efforts or HIV care take into um, context the actual reality that these women are living in. And so that means addressing the traumatic experiences or trying to address the gender inequality or the poverty or the mental health distress and the drinking and the addiction. We're currently conducting an NIH-funded R34 um, that is titled Improving the Health of South African Women with Traumatic Stress and HIV Care. And the goal of this R34 is to try to address the traumatic stress that occurs as a result of sexual trauma and the hopes of improving HIV care and engagement. It's a three-year study that was um, developed to really develop an intervention and then pilot test it. And the intervention is called IMPACT, and it stands for Improving AIDS Care After Trauma. And that intervention is designed to reduce avoiding coping, reduce the traumatic stress, and hopefully reduce other risk behaviors and increase engagement in care. And this is being piloted with women who are HIV positive, initiating treatment, and also who have experienced sexual trauma in their lifetimes. We built our intervention off of Dr. Sikama's previous LIFT intervention, which was done with HIV-positive individuals in New York City who experienced childhood sexual abuse. Um, LIFT is now a CDC evidence-based intervention, and the randomized control trial that was done with a diverse population of adults living with HIV showed that the LIFT group sessions really helped to reduce traumatic stress and help to reduce um, other sexual risk behaviors. And notably, when they did some mediation analyses, they really found that the pathway through which LIFT reduced um, traumatic stress was really by reducing avoidant coping. So this LIFT um, intervention really set a model for how we could try to reduce avoidant coping or promote more active coping in hopes of addressing traumatic stress in our population in South Africa. So we built, like I said, on the core elements of the LIFT intervention as well as um, on other theory and other evidence that was in the literature and did our best efforts to try to tailor um, an intervention to what was appropriate in the South African context. We used a conceptual model based on theories of stress and coping um, with a particular focus on avoidant coping and how to best reduce that. There was a lot of formative work that was done as a part of you know, developing and adapting this to the South African context um, that we did with in-depth interviews and focus group discussions with women and care providers um, to really tailor the intervention to something that was culturally appropriate. It was notable that in, one of the, in all the qualitative interviews that we did, about half of the women independently kind of came across to linking their sexual trauma experience with HIV and another quarter indirectly made that link between the sexual trauma they had experienced and HIV. So the impact intervention that we're now piloting consists of four sessions of individual counseling that address the topics of understanding that combine stress of sexual trauma and HIV, developing strategies for more effectively coping with their trauma, and really linking coping with their HIV care. There's also some kind of review and goal setting. And then those four individual sessions are followed by group sessions for a total of three. Um, and these are delivered by um, non-specialists in the HIV primary care clinics. This visual gives you a, a glimpse at how we've adapted the intervention to the local context. So instead of using an acronym that we had used and lift, you know, six so with safety, intimacy, power, and self-esteem. This was kind of visualized with an Invisa pot, a way for women to kind of visualize how the three pillars of power, self-esteem, and trust work together and reinforce and rely on one another to stand. There's also safety as the lid, um, a, a, a symbol that was very culturally relevant for the women and provided a, a segue into a lot of dialogue. This next visual also shows how we use what we call coping pebbles to get women to talk about you know, the overall global stressors that they're having, a bag full of pebbles, and then how they can open that bag up and start to you know, look at the different pebbles or different stressors and identify those that are changeable or those that are not changeable, and then tailor you know, how they might have coping strategies depending on whether that problem could be changed or not. Um, and so again, it's a nice tactile way to engage women in identifying coping strategies for, for how to you know, address the things in their lives that are both changeable and not. So far, we've completed enrollment, but the trial is still ongoing. So we 
were referred to us from the HIV clinic, about 141 participants in total. We screened the vast majority of them. Three were omitted because they had already initiated treatment or done the readiness sessions that we used as our control. Of the 138 that were screened, 60% of them were eligible, meaning 60% of the women that we screened just regularly initiating treatment had experienced sexual trauma in their lifetimes. Okay, that's a, we were very, it's consistent with what we had found, but these are very high rates of sexual trauma. Of those that were eligible, we had really high participation rates, about 78% of those that were eligible agreed and ultimately enrolled in our, in our trial. Um, we lost about 22%. Some of that was just scheduling. They didn't come to their baseline assessment or some, even though they technically experienced sexual abuse, they later said, well, it was, you know, a long time ago. I didn't really feel traumatized. I didn't really think this was for me. But again, very high rates. And we're in the process of completing the intervention and doing the three-month and six-month follow-ups. In terms of who we've enrolled in the study, of these 64 women who have all experienced um, sexual trauma and enrolled in the study, the average age was 29 and it ranged from 18 to 53. For the most part, the vast majority of participants had, had completed um, high school or some high school education. And most of them were in a relationship but not living together. There, there was you know, about 15% that were in a relationship um, and living together, and about 12% that were married. In addition to assessing sexual abuse for eligibility in the trial, we also assessed other forms of trauma. So we looked at physical abuse, not intimate partner violence related, and other types of trauma, including being mugged and witnessing violence, and found that 87% um, of the participants had experienced these forms of um, physical abuse in their, as an adult. 73% had experienced intimate partner violence as an adult. And sexual abuse was quite common as an adult as well, with 40% of the women experiencing sexual abuse with just the three months before the baseline assessment. So it really indicates you know, that this trauma is very much ongoing and that women are experiencing multiple forms of trauma. We also assessed different types of mental health indicators at baseline to be able to compare to three month and six month follow up. And we found that 56% of the participants reported clinically significant levels of traumatic stress, 64% reported clinically significant levels of depression, and about half of the sample reported clinically significant levels of anxiety. So we're in the process now of collecting the data at three months and six months to really see whether we see declines and whether we see hopefully more declines in the intervention. The key outcomes for this um, intervention that we're doing are really going to be engagement and care. So we're hoping to see improvements in retention and care, and that's both um, retention, sorry, engagement and care, which is defined as both retention and care and adherence. And for retention and care, we're asking participants to, to give us a self-report, but we're also doing a very detailed review of their medical records to look at you know, gaps between any visits and taking kind of standards of how to best use that med record to, to assess whether people are being retained. And for adherence, we're also having, in addition to the self-reported adherence, we're looking at the med records for pill counts, but we're also going to assess with the biological outcome, analyzing um, dry blood spot data. We'll be looking at the traumatic stress, the void and coping, and other risk behaviors. And I should say that while all this is ongoing and I don't have any results to share, um, we are also thinking you know, strategically and talking with our collaborators about ways forward and you know, with some at least positive trends indicated from the interventionists, we're hoping to put forward um, a proposal to NIH to really evaluate the effectiveness of, on a larger scale. Um, so on behalf of the other um, collaborators here at Duke and at UCT, I want to thank you for your time, and I'll take any clarifying questions. So we did a lot of um, adaptation and some cognitive frame, and I, I should say that I, as a postdoc, have been here since August, so Melissa, feel free to jump in. Um, but we did have used many of these measures before and did try to pilot test and do kind of cognitive um, interviewing to make sure they're being adapted. So far, I don't think the interviewers have reported any you know, issues or any kind of trouble understanding some of the
tough acts to follow, but I will um, do my best and, and share with you some of the work that I've done in Botswana um, on cervical cancer and addressing some of the challenges that Maggie brought up that apply not only to screening and early detection, but to cancer treatment as well. So um, as many of you probably know, worldwide cancer is a huge and growing problem. So it kills more people than AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis combined. And the majority of uh, cases and 70% of cancer deaths occur in low and middle income countries where the resources are, are the most limited. That, those numbers reflect probably an underestimate of the true burden of cancer, and that's because there aren't um, appropriate diagnostic methods. So as we've talked about already, screening is, an, is often inadequate. But there's also low quality data gathering systems. So in high income countries, we have cancer registries that are really comprehensive, really widespread, that give us a good sense of cancer epidemiology. In low and middle income countries, we really just don't have the same infrastructure, and so the data gathering systems aren't as good to give us incidents. Nonetheless, based on what we know, we know that the burden of cancer is large and it's projected to rise in the future and global cancer mortality is projected to double by the year 2030. Cervical cancer is the most common cause of death in African, in cancer death in African women. So um, although it is in the United States, it's not one of the most common um, cancers in women. Cancer incidence and death from, cerv from cervical cancer is very, very high, particularly in Africa. The incidence is six times greater in women who have HIV infection, and more than two-thirds of all HIV infection occurs in sub-Saharan Africa. And so Botswana is a country where there's a lot of HIV and there's a lot of cervical cancer, and so kind of how those two interact is, is the focus of this work. There are some major challenges to cancer care delivery. This little bullet point could be like a whole talk onto itself. So um, cancer care, we'll kind of go through these briefly, but there's a low awareness of cancer and a high stigma of cancer. So um, it almost mimics the way that people perceived HIV when it first started to become a major problem. People are nervous to talk about a cancer diagnosis. It can be disfiguring, it can be debilitating, and they, they view it in some ways and in some places as something that shouldn't be talked about. Um, there's a major shortage of trained healthcare workers, so um, some of the cancer therapies are complex. It requires, in, in high income countries, it requires not only medical training, but even further subspecialized training. And so um, there's a shortage of workers who can provide that care. And then the cost and the complexity of the treatment. So for cervical cancer, typically there, we're using a combination of chemotherapy external beam radiation and internal radiation, which is called brachytherapy. It's a lot of care coordination, multiple providers. Um, for the patient, even when we have resources like patient navigators, physicians who are aware of the complexity, um, for the patient, it's really overwhelming to kind of move through the healthcare system to get all these different kinds of treatment. So Botswana is a country um, right near South Africa, right north of South Africa, with about 2 million people. It's a middle-income country. Um, they have a stable democracy there, and they have a national health care system with universal access to care. It's very large and relatively sparsely populated. So one of the challenges is that most people live in rural communities, and they've set up this amazing um, decentralized network of um, clinics. Is this a pointer? Yeah, so you can see that there's 844 mobile posts where care is delivered, health care, um, but only three referral hospitals, and that's where the cancer care is concentrated. So how do you get all of these people to these three centers for treatment that can last weeks, if not months? Um, but Botswana is a really interesting place to do this work because they have already um, demonstrated that they have, they're capable of of rolling out a really successful healthcare program. So um, they are a real HIV success story. So in 2000, the life expectancy in Botswana was less than 40 years due to the HIV epidemic. In 2002, they had their first nationwide antiretroviral therapy program that was released. And in 2008, the coverage increased to 80%. So unbelievable coverage given what I was telling you about the landscape and the geography. And now the life expectancy is greater than 65 years. So they've been unbelievably successful in addressing the HIV epidemic. Um, as a result of that, survival has improved, 
there's been aging of the HIV population, and so there's an increased incidence of cancer. So cancers are diseases that tend to occur with aging, and so um, there's been an increase in that. And visits to the public oncology clinic increased threefold from 2002 to 2005. And I thought this was kind of an um, illustrative picture. So hospital wards that were previously, previously used for other things um, are transitioned to oncology care in kind of a makeshift sort of a way. So um, cancer in Botswana is really the intersection of cancer and HIV care, which makes it more, um, a little bit more complicated. And so back in 2010, 2011, we did an oncology needs assessment. Um, it was a formalized way of sort of doing an intake of what the resources were and what further resources were needed. And we identified several areas, including education, research, and clinical care um, as potential areas for collaboration. What I'm going to focus on is this research piece. So the Botswana Prospective Cancer Cohort is a study that's been ongoing now for about um, seven years. So this study, um, when we were doing our needs assessment, there was an investigator uh, from Harvard, his name is Scott Dryden Peterson. He's an infectious disease <coughs> doctor who was recognizing that this cancer problem was ongoing. And so he started this cohort and we joined up. Um, we started enrolling patients with a new cancer diagnosis, so any cancer, uh, that presented to Princess Marina Hospital, which was the main public hospital in Havarone, and then we added the two other referral hospitals over time. The initial intake is really extensive, so we collect a lot of information on risk factors, cancer stage, treatment plan, um, patients whose HIV status is unknown are tested, and we have follow-up visits and calls every three months to assess vital status with really low uh, loss to follow-up. Um, and we currently capture about 65% of reported cancer cases, and our current enrollment is over 2,000. So recently we published a study looking at the cervical cancer cases within this larger cohort. We had 348 women with cervix cancer that were diagnosed between 2010 and 2015. And what we were aiming to do was look at the effect of HIV on survival. And believe it or not, this question, does HIV infection affect cancer survival, hadn't really been examined in a low and middle income country, in a cohort that's um, in a low and middle income country. So, we did this study and basically what we found was that the three-year survival was significantly different for people with HIV infection. So 48% um, were alive at three years in the uninfected group <coughs> versus 35% in the infected group and HIV infection significantly increased the risk of death with a, with a hazard ratio of almost two. The one thing to notice is that these numbers are devastatingly low. So even in the uninfected group, um, we see numbers much higher than this for cervix cancer that's treated in the United States. Um, and remember, like Maggie was talking about in her presentation, this is a preventable cancer that can be detected early when it's curable with, a very, with very minimal treatment. And so it's, it's really, um, as an oncologist, it's, it's sad to see and it's shocking to see, but it also means that there's a lot of opportunity for, for intervention. Um, this is probably hard to read. Apologize for that, but basically this is looking at the effect of HIV on survival um, based on these different variables, and the effect was greater for younger patients, those with earlier cancer stage, and those whose treatment intention was curative. So again, young people who are otherwise healthy, who were shooting for a cure, the, having HIV affected those patients the most. So from this study, we concluded that HIV nearly doubled the risk of death, and overall, cervical cancer mortality was very high, irrespective of HIV status. Um, less than 50% of patients received guideline concordant care, and about 30 to 35% of patients in both groups received inadequate radiotherapy dose. Um, of those that received inadequate radiotherapy dose, about 60% of those were due to inadequate brachytherapy administration. That's the internal radiation that I was telling you about. So um, we've done a lot of different studies like this, looking at different cancers, looking at um, the impact of time from diagnosis to cancer treatment initiation. We're trying to understand the epidemiology, the practice patterns, and the outcomes. Um, but alongside this work, there have been several clinical initiatives. So University of Pennsylvania, where I did my training, has a partnership in Botswana. I mentioned the folks from Harvard who are working in Botswana, and there are a couple of other folks as well. 
Um, one of the major contributions of the international partners um, has been to provide personnel and education to support the brachytherapy program. And that's really a critical part of treating cervical cancers, being able to do this internal radiation called brachytherapy. Um, the program in Botswana started in 2012. Prior to that, cases were sent to South Africa. So Johannesburg is a four-hour drive from Havrone, so you can imagine many patients never made it um, and couldn't stay there for the duration of their treatment. Now they treat about 60 patients per month, and treating in-country has decreased cost, improved access, and enhanced the coordination of care. This is kind of a busy table, but basically this is radiation usage in Botswana, and these are brachytherapy insertions. So from 2001 to 2011, there were not any. Um, but then you can see a pretty rapid increase in um, the use of this service. Um, so this is a, just an excerpt from the needs assessment we did. Botswana is really uniquely positioned to be a country that can be an example for building cancer core capacity. The Ministry of Health has recognized cancer as a priority. They've partnered with several different international programs. Um, and the goal of this, this very collaborative model of healthcare infrastructure building is to really grow capacity that's sustainable um, for the country um, to continue with its treatment. So in conclusion, um, in the post-antiretroviral therapy era, cancer is a large and growing problem in the HIV population, both in the United States, but also in settings where, uh, global settings where HIV burden is high. And Botswana is really at the crossroads of HIV infection and cancer. The HIV burden is still high, but they're transitioning to kind of managing the chronic sequela of that. Um, and the Botswana Prospective Cancer Cohort is working to identify areas for additional research and clinical focus. And I think Botswana has really, um, it can really serve as a model, as we talked about, because they've, they've successfully partnered the government with academic institutions, with local providers in high and middle income countries. This is a huge, huge team effort, and um, not this slide doesn't represent everybody who's been involved, but there's been a lot of individuals who've helped, and most of all our study staff, the residents and students who've gone and collected data um, in, in a setting where it's often difficult to collect data. And what's one of the patients hold on to their own charts, so it's very difficult to do chart reviews, to go back and find anything retrospectively, so um, we've had some really dedicated folks who've helped us collect this data. Are there any um, clarifying questions for Dr. Suneja? <laughs> yeah, quick one. Um, you've shown that HIV has an impact on certain cancer outcomes. Is that, is that regardless of suppression or not? So that's a good question. So in our cohort, about two-thirds of the um, individuals have HIV infection. And of those, most of them are on antiretroviral therapy and are, are controlled. So um, we didn't look specifically at those who had low viral load versus high viral load, um, but most people who have a diagnosis have access to care and are treated. That's a good question. So we'll open it up to questions um, for the entire panel. I wanted to say what's really nice about this panel, and I know some of you guys have to go to class, um, is that it sort of is the spectrum of prevention and treatment, and I really liked that. So. Um, so I'm going to open it, open it up to the floor. Uh, Dr. Kuchko, you spoke a little bit about some of the challenges to scale up in your program, not least of which that you couldn't be everywhere all at once. <laughs> and I think that that's probably a common problem in scale up is um, that when there's a really active team on site, um, things tend to run a little bit more smoothly. But I wonder if you could just speak a little bit more to kind of some of that challenge of scaling up to more sites and more rural areas in the country. Um, is this working? Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, I think that's that's true, and it's a really um, big learning point for me because as a fellow, I really enjoy the opportunity to live in Kisumu, and I worked in the clinic every day. I did training on site mentorship, and I did not. I don't think I took that into account as much as I needed to when I was thinking of how the program would then scale beyond me because the nurse that I had worked with and trained with, she stayed and was dedicated to the program after I moved back to San Francisco, but she was not able to be physically present. And so, uh, you know, the that experience of, of transitioning to this decentralized model and having things, I don't want to say fall apart, but certainly not 
work in a way that I would consider at all effective. What really helped me review the literature that was supporting these um, labor-intensive interventions that were aimed at low-level providers. I feel like there was a big trend in the literature in, like five years ago that we can decentralize and task shift to low-level providers, but on the ground, if there's not support and there's not resources and there's not attention to what the, their overall burden of work is, um, it's not going to be sustainable. So, you know, I don't think high tech is the tech is the answer for everything, but looking at something that really takes into account how the workforce is able to be trained and, and how they're able to manage their their um, workload is really essential. Question for Dr. Christian Go out. So the, when you um, when you talk about providers in the settings you were in, what what, what are we talking about? Physicians? Um, so expert trained nurses? Like who are no, providers? So providers um, in the clinics, we really don't have any physicians seeing providers. The clinics are staffed by clinical officers, which would be the equivalent of a PA. Um, so it's a two year degree after. Um, uh, undergrad, uh, not undergrad, but high school, which is not high school there, um, and then nurses. So nurses are often in charge, and then most of the work is done by clinical officers. So we did some studies showing that clinical officers could do LEAP, which in the U.S. is pretty much only done by physicians, some um, nurse practitioners, and that could be done safely. Um, but we were training clinical officers to do visual inspection with acetic so acid. Their, their initial training doesn't sound like it includes a lot of they all, care. They all have um, done pelvic exam training in the in the nurse schooling. Um, and then with HPV, the the providers are community health workers or research assistants who are trained to do the counseling and provide the, the specimen collection kit. So we don't have any. We don't have any clinically trained providers in our programs now doing the HPV testing. Well, Dr. Hatchko as well. <laughs> Sorry. But I was just curious if you could, uh, about your community-focused model. You were mentioning that that was what made the real change from, you know, people getting screened, tested, uh, treated. So I was just wondering if you could elaborate a little more on the community-based model. Like, how did you engage the community? What did you do? How did you interact with stakeholders find out about their needs and how to target those needs? Um, so there we were really um, fortunate to piggyback on a long-standing relationship with the HIV care program. So we had very good relationships with the Ministry of Health, the um, county health management teams, our um, cervical cancer coordinator, who's the site PI in the study, had been working with the, the county to help scale up their cervical cancer prevention program, essentially with very little funding. You know, she was trying to leverage what was coming from the government, what we could support. So we had really um, existing relationships with the administration, and then the study coordinator that I got for the team had been working with the SEARCH study, which did the community health campaigns for HIV testing. So she had observed um, and um, participated in their community outreach campaigns. And we didn't go to the same communities, but we used the same model uh, engaging with the reproductive health team and the county health management team, and then engaging with the, the chiefs and the assistant chiefs, um, and then the key stakeholders in the community. We did focus group discussions um, before the, the program started to identify further people in the communities that we were going, going to be working in. Um, our study leadership team went out and did site assessment um, in about 24 communities that fit our criteria, criteria before we evaluated the 12. So during those site assessments, they introduced the studies and you know, explained what we were gonna do, look, looked at what our criteria was and how they fit in. And then our campaigns themselves are slated for six weeks. Two weeks is re-engaging with the community to let them know what we're coming, figure out where we would be and when, um, and then get sort of the specific contextualization. We engage people, we engage the community health workers assigned to that community um, to help with mobilization and then the day of, and then the campaigns themselves 
were in a specific village or sublocation for one day, and then another one for another day. So they were 10 days total, so Monday through Friday, of two weeks um, within the community. So we covered the whole area at different locations. And then we had two weeks of community debrief where we specifically sought feedback from the community to see what went well, what didn't go well, and make sure that we weren't, you know, coming in and trampling all of their grass with their tents or doing something, you know, really offensive. May, we, I think, didn't get any negative feedback. Um, and for the most part, that really helped um, with engagement. Um, this question is for Dr. Watt. Um, so obviously the trends among uh, the population where you work is very troubling in regards to drinking and fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Um, so, and as you kind of alluded to, um, the women don't seem either know the risks and are prioritizing future thoughts, or they just don't know. Um, so, what with that in mind? What do you think a long-term sustainable solution might be? Is it like education, or um, how, how are you going to deal with that? Yeah, I mean, I I think a big part of it is social norms and sort of changing social norms, and we've seen that sort of happen here in the U.S. in terms of what's normative for drinking during pregnancy um, and kind of social pressures then to not drink during pregnancy. <coughs> but I also think, you know, a lot of it is sort of bigger structural issues and issues around um, development and opportunities. And, you know, it's hard to think about your future when kind of the day-to-day -day is so perilous. Um, and I think that probably for so many of us, like the issues come back to that in terms of kind of bigger um, issues of development and infrastructure. But in the in the short term, I I also think it's about um, you know the, this intervention that uh, that we proposed in this R21 study. We're really thinking about how do we kind of just create conversations around. The, the tools we have and the power we can have over our own lives to make choices about when to become pregnant, what our life with children might look like, what we want as a, as a parent. Um, because, you know, so much of it's interesting because almost all of our interviews across all of our topics, when you ask sort of what are your main motivators, I mean, it's the kids. And, and they want to sort of you know, adhere to HIV treatment because of the kids. They want to stop drinking because of the kids. Sort of, you know, kids, once they're there, are such a big motivator. And so if we can think about kind of harnessing some of that motivation in the pre-pregnancy period to think about, okay, you know, if you, you know, if you want to have a kid, like, here are the choices you can make, here are the ways you can sort of, can defer that until you're ready, and here's what you need to do to, to sort of, you know, put your put your child on their best foot forward um, in terms of your behavior during pregnancy. So, so it's it's an education, but it's not the kind of education that's happening now, which is sort of you know lectures when you go to your clinic appointments. Um, it's it's a more kind of community conversations and empowerment. Can I just have a follow-up question, Melissa? The, so do you have a sense? Maybe you all asked and. If most of the women knew people who had had children affected by fetal alcohol syndrome or not? That was kind of hard to get to. There was kind of some antidotes. But I think what, what was even more powerful for women is that they knew a lot of women who had drunk alcohol during pregnancy and they didn't see any and they didn't see any effects. So that evidence was just as strong as the other evidence. Now there's really low rates of diagnosis. Um, for for FASD and behavioral issues, so you know, I mean, it, it, and it's hard for them if, if there isn't kind of that the the sort of pointing it out and the acknowledgement and the labeling. It's hard to make that make that connection as opposed to well, that's a slow kid or that's you know the kid's not doing well in school or has is hyperactive or whatever sort of the manifestations of that might be. I was like, I have questions too. Are we allowed to <laughs> We have questions. <laughs> I have a question for Martha. For uh, who who were the counselors who provided the individual sessions, and what was the training of the people who who did the the, the others were group. The group. Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah. 
So right now we have, um, because it's just a small, you know, 32 participants that have been randomized to the intervention, all the intervention sessions are provided by one interventionist. Um, and she is a non-specialist. She doesn't have her bachelor's yet, but she's working on it. Um, and so, you know, we've thought a lot about what we would do as we scale up in terms of what type of training we would want. I think originally we were thinking be psych counselors um, or nurses who had had some um, mental health training. Um, and I think it seems like we'll probably go back to that in terms of just scalability and feasibility for moving forward. Um, but right now, she's been quite effective, um, and it's been interesting to see how, as a non-specialist doing these interventions, she's really grown in her ability to reflect on the process and to provide feedback to us. We were there last week, and you know, she was really able to, in a, in a way that she wasn't able to when we first started, talk about how she sees the women changing over time. And, and one more for, uh, I'm really interested in the HIV and cervical cancer kind of connection. It started with your map and then in the end where you were talking about it also. And I'm wondering if, as kind of, if there is a way to more intentionally combine the, the two services, uh, particularly for screening. And if there's, you know, people who are HIV positive are more likely to have cervical cancer and if people with cervical cancer are more likely to be HIV positive, if there's some kind of combination in leveraging the systems that are out there for HIV. <laughs> we just got a CEPA grant to do that um, with the, with the oh, HIV great. program, <laughs> like the plant. We were just talking about that. So um, uh, we are going to leverage a um, the latest round of PEPFAR funding for HIV in this uh, region is funding, is trying to meet the 90-90-90 target, so to get 90% of people tested, they're going to do um, community engagement in these large scale campaigns that were originally studied in the search campaign that I had been referring to. So that's just going to be implemented as part of the program. And we got a CFAR grant to do HPV testing as part of that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're the campaigns will target everyone because it's going to be a multi-disease campaign. So we will see new HIV infections, but hopefully people who are HIV infected who want to come for other services. Mm -hmm. And then we'll link newly infected to treatment at the HIV clinic. Yeah, in Botswana, in some ways, it's easier to screen women who are HIV infected because they come to clinic and they're at the other point of care um, screening that can be done. And so um, their screening program that they had started around, I guess it was around 2009, 2010, was for HIV infected women. And so they're trying to take advantage of the fact that these patients are already plugged into the healthcare system. But yeah, I think there's definitely synergies. We know that HPV infection is more likely in people with HIV, which is probably why the rates are so high. So, Thank you. So I had a question for you, Vita. Is the Botswana national strategy then to still keep cancer treatment services kind of centralized with these hospitals and then just work on ways of getting people coming in from the mobile posts? It is for now. So um, for certain things like surgery, there's only they only have expertise at the main referral hospitals. Radiotherapy, there's a huge equipment um, outlay of infrastructure that needs to um, be put together, but they're expanding the scope. So they're adding more machines, they're trying to hire people with expertise in these areas. But yeah, for now, the idea is still that these three centers would provide care and people still have to come. There's still a lot of attrition when you get people who have to come and stay in a city that's hours away for several weeks. So um, I think improving screening in other parts of the country to identify cancers and to identify precancerous lesions that can be treated is definitely the way to, to go moving forward. But in the meantime, we have all these people who already have a cancer. So I was just trying to figure out if Botswana and Kenya had different national strategies and how they might be trying to treat it more at a community level versus more centralized level and if there were any sort of lessons learned across countries or not. So only treatment in Kenya is available in Nairobi. The only radiation okay. treatment. So I if I can ask a question, I'm just wondering how stage one is treated mm -hmm. in Botswana because I saw on your um, the last slide where you presented where the risk of HIV impacts most on the cancer mortality. It was in the stage one disease. Yes. So there's unfortunately not a lot of stage one. So most women who come in get diagnosed with locally advanced disease, but there's also um, there's so staging is in and of itself tricky because staging is clinical. 
So here we get MRIs, PET CT scans. We have a lot of advanced um, technology that we can use to understand someone's extent of disease, but it doesn't actually change their stage because the stage is designed to be used anywhere, even where they don't have MRI, CT, things like that. So I think there's a lot of understaging, probably, um, but typically women, even with early stage disease, are treated with chemo radiation. So in Kenya, women with early stage disease are preferentially treated with surgery because there's so little um, about availability of chemo radiation. Mm -hmm. Any last? bunch of reasons. So one is, like in Botswana, with HIV control, there's been aging of the population. So cancers that are more common in the elderly are more are becoming more common in this population. Um, so things like breast cancer, even prostate cancer is not uncommon in, in Botswana. But then there's also kind of a westernization of the culture. So there's more, there's changes in diet, there's changes in exposures, there's um, more chemical exposures, more smoking. Um, things like that that put people at higher risk as well. Um, so I think that there, that's also a piece of it. That's great. Can we have another round of applause? Perfect.